Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guests today are Susan Siegfried and Alexander Potts. Susan Siegfried is the Dennis Riley, I'm sorry, the Denise Riley Collegiate Professor of the History of Art and Professor of Women's Studies at the University of Michigan. Siegfried's research has focused on European art of the 18th and 19th centuries, especially the French art world of the Revolutionary and Romantic periods. Her interests include the, the thematization of gender, social spaces for viewing art, and theoretical models of interpretation. She gave a talk titled The Cultural Politics of Fashion and the French Revolution of 1830 on May 2nd, 2017 as a guest of the U of O's Department of the History of Art and Architecture. Alexander Potts is the Max Lohr Collegiate Professor of the History of Art at the University of Michigan. His work on art and artistic theory covers a, numbers of, a number of areas, sculptural aesthetics and the history of sculpture, experimental practices and the aesthetics of realism in 20th century art, art and artistic theory in the 19th century, and enlightenment and post-enlightenment conceptions of the classical ideal. Potts gave a talk titled Temporality in Modern Sculpture on May 4, 2017, as a guest of the U of O's Department of the History of Art and Architecture. Thank you both so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Thank you for having us. Susan, I'm going to start with you. Um, what led to your particular interest in French art of the Revolutionary and Romantic periods? Why did you wind up specializing in that area? Uh, I would say it had to do with my educational formation. <laughs> <laughs> and beginning with um, learning French in high school, mm -hmm. of which I've just been reminded. Um, and then in college, I took an art history course with a woman, one of the few women then teaching at the university level. Uh, Eugenia Perry Janis, who was teaching in 19th century French art, and I think par partly because of the linguistic background, I became quite enamored of it. But the focus then was on Impressionism mm -hmm. rather than the first part mm -hmm. uh, of the century. And um, that I became interested in because when I then went on to graduate uh, school, I ended up working on an artist named Ingres. Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres on his critical reputation. And Ingres had his foot in the 18th century, but his career, and he lived a very long time, mm -hmm. uh, extended through the 19th century. And I needed to understand where he came from. He was in many respects a child of the revolution, which introduced m major changes in the art world. And um, that's what got me hooked on trying to understand that uh, quite seismic um, transformation in culture in, of Europe in the 1790s. So tell us what are the most notable seismic changes that the revolution brings about in France, in French culture and French art in particular? Well, it, it, it didn't introduce the idea, but it made vivid the idea that a monarchical government may not last, <laughs> striking fear into the hearts of monarchs uh, throughout Europe, and introduced a contractual or constitutional form of government for France. England, of course, already had that by this point, but I think because of the dominance of the French court since the period of Louis XIV, so for a good 150 years, this change uh, um, caused people to sit up and take notice. Mm -hmm. um, it, um, because of the indebtedness to enlightenment thought, there was a concern really to make over society on every conceivable level. And that had very interesting uh, manifestations in a cultural way with respect to reinventing a calendar, remaking time, remaking the external appearance of people. Dress was very symbolically coded. Um, forms of art patronage were taken away from a hierarchical corporation controlled academic structure and thrown open to all artists in France, making it really a national movement, for mm -hmm. example. And uh, there was a push to represent the contemporary present, mm -hmm. which was an anthema to academic theory. So there was a real tug of war in the 1790s of the revolutionary governments trying to get the revolution celebrated in visual form and artists resisting that and trying to work with what they had been trained uh, mm. to do. So you, you, um, you mentioned that one of the many things that changes is the way people dress, 
right. their fashion. Yes. And yeah. the talk that you're giving at the U of O is entitled The Cultural Politics of Fashion and the French Revolution of 1830, which is not the French Revolution that most Americans think of. When the 1789, rev so, the Great Revolution. So, so <laughs> give us a sense <laughs> yeah. of this lesser revolution and its impact on the cultural politics of fashion. Um, y yes, I, I've come to this work actually fairly recently. I would say the, the difference in 18, 1830 uh, revolution looks back to the 1789 revolution, and so it's, it's parasitic mm -hmm. on that earlier revolution in two respects. It, um, it both depends upon its forms and its symbolism, uh, including sartorial symbolism, um, and at the same time, it propels oddly fashion to the level of becoming a cultural language that can serve in a critical capacity with regard to the culture at large, so that cultural fashion as a language becomes politicized mm -hmm. um, and is used by various parties to critique the then existing forms of government, which involved actually throwing out a returned monarchy mm -hmm. and putting in a constitutional king, um, but also even extending to foreign policy of France with respect to colonization. Um, and I, th that's interesting and curious to me that, that um, fashion could serve in this function because fashion and politics had generally been constructed as antithetical, mm -hmm. as having nothing to do with each other. One realm is frivolous and one is serious, one is masculine, one is feminine. Mm -hmm. And so this particular conjunction, I think partly has to do with them being forced together and also with um, this often takes the form of a, of a satirical or parodic uh, use of fashion. Mm. And there's a kind of double speak, mm -hmm. a double language, mm -hmm. which, is, which comes into being or is forced into being partly because of attempts of censorship mm -hmm. on the level of the government that's being ousted and pretty soon on the part of the new government that's, mm. that, that succeeds. Could you give an example of this parodic um, fashion or, or? Yes, there, one of the leading new fashion journals in Paris, which is called La Mode Fashion, um, be, be, this is just before the revolution of 1830, mm -hmm. publishes an article um, called the Assemblée Législative de la Mode. So the Legislative Assembly is turned into, in this textual parody, um, and a legislative assembly of fashion. And not only that, but the running of it is turned over to women. Um, so fashion, which had always been thought of as despotic and tyrannical, the, the imagery, the symbolic imagery of fashion is that fashion is a tyrant. Now it becomes um, a, de a debated legislative assembly in mm -hmm. which women will decide important things such as the length of skirts and the height of hairdos and things like this. And all of this is, um, is essentially a send up and criticism of the current political situation, which is in fact a kind of hung parliament. Mm -hmm. um, so the suspension of the parliament, uh, which came about because of a standoff between the king and a much despised minister um, is, is brought into the open through this extreme, which sort of turns the political world on its head by calling this an assembly of fashion and mm. turning it over to women. Um, the result of that was that the fashion icon of the then Bourbon court, the Duchess of Berry, the Duchesse de Berry, her patronage is withdrawn from this journal. She had mm. been the patron of the journal. And the editors love this <laughs> and um, publish the dirty linen of mm. the uh, letter of dismissal in public and say how wonderful that um, the Duchesse de Berry takes so seriously the most august of our institutions, mm -hmm. <laughs> certainly not more seriously than we take. Uh, the, the the parliament. I love that so. you described the letter as uh, her dirty linen, which is a yes, lovely actually, example yes. of this. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so. so since you're working on this kind of intersection mm -hmm. of politics and fashion or culture, mm -hmm. cultural production, what are some of the kinds of 
uh, archival materials that you're d drawing on when you do this kind of research? I mean, I've it must be a range of stuff, right? Yes, I've been drawing uh, especially on periodicals from uh, the period as well as political writing during the period. That is to say, uh, the fashion press or women's press tends to be a cultural segment of the press mm -hmm. that was thought to be unthreatening mm -hmm. and therefore looser as regards um, censorship than the press that was co that was actually commenting on politics. I'm looking at both those segments of the press. Um, I'm looking at a lot of visual culture imagery. So th this is a moment when there's a new technology of printmaking, lithography, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, becomes commercially viable and is much cheaper than the earlier forms of reproductive printmaking engraving. So a lot of this satirical imagery is coming um, th that concerns itself with fashion and using fashion to, to make fun of politicians and women, is, is taking the form of lithography. There are journals that are beginning to publish um, images alongside text mm. and use ima feature imagery and that will lead to Daumier ultimately, mm -hmm. will lead to a great, the great era of political caricature uh, in France. Um, I'm looking at correspondence when I can find it, that's a needle in the haystack, mm -hmm. but I'm interested in, uh, I'm interested in what W women who are often the object of representation, textual and visual, especially as regards fashion, for a long time, um, w how they either experienced um, the wearing of the clothes in question mm -hmm. or their representation. It's very hard to find their voices mm -hmm. uh, in this period. So I'm also uh, sort of slowly trying to go through <laughs> uh, correspondence. And then I'm interested in um, aesthetic issues as well. Um, clothing had a particular status in art theory going mm -hmm. back to the Renaissance. Um, the, uh, I've looked both at high art theory, academic art theory, but also at a more, um, I guess I would call it vernacular or mundane level of artist manuals that are published for it's usually called students and amateur, mm -hmm. though you suspect that that may be a cover for other readers. Mm -hmm. But in those um, manuals, there will be some more practical advice about the painting or representation of clothing. And this was a low category of subject matter as far as high art mm -hmm. theory was mm -hmm. concerned, which wished artists to concern themselves with drapery, but not with contemporary. Dress. So I'm I'm looking at that area of um, artistic theory and different, if you will, different theoretical uh, or practical sources that address the painting of clothing. Are any of these journals, are the contributors to these journals women, or are any of these art theorists female art theorists? Or there are some. They are rare. Um, the the whole question of female contributors is one I've actually thought about uh, and written about because m men ventriloquize female mm -hmm. voices mm -hmm. in this period um, for f uh, what they construct as a female readership. And again, we don't, it, it's very hard to get hardcore mm -hmm. sociological data of reception for this period of time comparable to what we have today. So one is dealing as much with literary constructions mm -hmm. as actually knowing who the subscribers or readers were. Um, and one can find some evidence of gendering in the construction of voices and the responses, but there's also a lot of um, male appropriation mm -hmm. of a, 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 and projection of a conception of what fashion is, what women are interested in, what they, uh, how their works are evaluated if they are writers. For are example. there examples of women who are passing as men or, you know, uh, writing under male pseudonyms or? George Saint is uh, the major uh, figure uh, coming out of this the period. the most yeah. important one, but are there others um, that you're aware of? I mean, that you've come across? I mean, there may not be. I'm just there curious. are um, often using, um, uh, Marie Dagou actually is another uh, one a little bit later than the period I'm, I'm working on, um, and she published under the pen name Daniel Stern, mm. 
and originally under the name of Franz Liszt, who was her <laughs> lover <laughs> for a period. So she wrote things that he, that were published under his name and um, became uh, an important critic of art. Uh, uh, Saint was less interested in mm -hmm. the visual arts, though a great friend of Delacroix, mm -hmm. um, but very interested in women's issues and the status of women in this period. So is this, is this the project that you're currently working on, or do you have other projects that you're working on? This is part of a, a book project on visual representations of fashion and costume, which is a sort of separate mm. category, <laughs> mm. um, in the, from, the, post, from, from the, the Great Revolution of 1789 mm -hmm. forward. Um, I hope I will get as far as Mallarmé, <laughs> who wrote himself, this is in the 1870s, mm -hmm a journal called La Dernière Mode, a fashion mm. journal in which he mm. ventriloquized three different female persona mm. as the editor's writing every single article in this, including the descriptions of clothing. Oh, well, I do hope you get there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Me too. <laughs> so, Alex, I'm going to turn to you now. We're about mm -hmm. halfway through our time. Um, so, I understand from doing our research that we do, mm. the, as an undergrad, you studied mathematics, physics, and chemistry. So right. how did you wind up being an art historian? How did you get from math well, and physics? Well, it was a rather tortuous path, but I, um, I got um, a scholarship to go and study in Oxford. I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto. And um, I was there, and I sort of gradually experienced an increasing disconnect <laughs> from <laughs> theoretical <laughs> chemistry or mathematical chemistry, which was supposed to be my subject. I started attending a lot of lectures, and I was incredibly lucky that there were some really kind of amazingly dynamic people lecturing on art history, Edgar Vint being one of them. Mm. Francis Haskell was another. Nicholas Pevsner came mm. and gave a series of lectures. I was with a group of people who um, were very interested in the visual arts and artistic culture. I always felt there was a bit of a problem being in the science world, that I wasn't really connected with the cultural world. So I took a bit of a gamble and um, registered on a MA in um, History of Art at Oxford and got that and then stayed with it ever since. Um, I actually financed that year transitioning into history of art by teaching um, uh, mathematics to uh, first year chemists. So <laughs> 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 yes. a, an excellent part of the story. So one of your areas of specialty is, is sculpture, yeah. in particular uh, late 19th and 20th century mm -hmm. sculpture. And in your m most recent uh, monograph, I know that you've um, you've intervened into discussions of of uh, late nineteenth and early and twentieth century sculpture by questioning the view that the most thing that what we need to know about sculpture of that period is uh, abstraction that it's mm -hmm. that it's heavily influenced by various forms of abstraction and that um, uh, an experimentation. Mm -hmm. So, tell us why that sort of conventional view is limited and what you're um, adding to that story. Well, I think I wouldn't say that I was necessarily saying moving away from considering sculpture. I just mm -hmm. say that that's not really the key issue as mm -hmm. far as sculpture is concerned. And I got really interested in the way sculpture has to be activated through a viewer's interaction with the work of sculpture. I mm -hmm. mean, the, the sculpture is a static thing, but one's viewing of sculpture is dynamic. Um, and I was, um, I really sort of traced the idea of people trying to find alternative understandings of sculpture to the idea that sculpture is basically a formal pure abstract form. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it interesting. I was trying to find other ways into thinking about sculpture, which a number of people have done. And um, actually one of the moments that really interested me was the minimalist moment mm -hmm. where in fact there was a sort of shift of emphasis which was articulated even by the artists themselves away from just considering the object and thinking about the relationship between the object and its environment and the relationship between the viewer and the work. And where sculpture is rather different from painting is that the environment, of course, always matters. 
um, how it's displayed, mm -hmm. what the surroundings are. The sculpture is always something in an environment. It's never, it's not framed in exactly the same way than the painting. As some, I suppose you might argue that some sculptures that are put in niches are perhaps a little bit more like paintings in that respect, mm -hmm. that they're kind of set off from the viewer. So that's what really, um, and I was, I was interested in the idea that this, if you look at sculpture from this point of view, obviously, yes, there was a huge change in the early 20th century. Um, but some of the fundamental problems actually were being already being addressed in earlier sculpture. And as I had uh, begun my career thinking about neoclassicism in the late 18th century and early 19th century, I, got, I was interested in showing how some of these issues were actually played out in the very self-conscious sculptural aesthetic mm -hmm. that was developed in and around classicism in the late 18th and early 19th century. That was figurative sculpture, but it's not saying that it's necessarily figurative work that only operates in this way. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to take away it, it, it's to move away from sort of um, sort of hypostatizing abstraction as the key issue to kind of take on board. And as I'm somebody who's also interested in um, uh, the sort of politics um, and the sort of sociology of art, mm -hmm. Um, if you take into account the context in which a sculpture is shown and of your interaction, you bring a little bit more of the social and political into the equation as mm -hmm. far as aesthetics of sculpture is concerned. Mm -hmm. So the talk that you're giving at the University of Oregon is called Temporality yeah. in Modern Sculpture. So again, this seems to me um, temporality. Yeah. Um, there's a static thing. There's a no temporality. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us what you what, what you're going to talk about in that regard. Well, I think I mean one. I must say that one thing that I I was uh, that prompted me to think about it is it does seem at this particular juncture that temporality is an issue that's engaging a lot mm -hmm. of people, both in art studies and in also in literary studies. Mm -hmm. And again, sort of following a slight a line which is a little bit like my concern with the viewer's interaction with the sculpture, I wanted to show that this issue of temporality is not just something that has been invented by the contemporary art scene where people actually do have moving elements within a sculpture, mm -hmm. but to say that some element of temporality is inherent in our understandings of sculpture. And I suppose one way of putting it is that, you know, sculpture is two things. One is it's supposed to endure, <laughs> it's supposed to be stable. Mm -hmm. um, and part of its traditional function was as a monument, mm -hmm. to, to be there forever. Mm -hmm. But it has to come alive. Mm -hmm. And if it um, is, if it, it, if it doesn't, if there isn't a temporal dimension to the conception of the sculpture, it just becomes dead. Mm. Of course, there's a straightforward way that temporality I int is, is introduced by virtue of the fact that you always have a relationship with a sculpture which takes place in time. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also the factor that if you look at a figurative sculpture, I mean, almost even Egyptian sculptors don't just stand still. Mm -hmm. They're always both still and moving. And that is the difficult thing that traditional sculpture had to kind of negotiate, is somehow being both. And in this case, I really got drawn into it thinking about Giacometti sculpture, mm -hmm. where you have these thin figures that mm -hmm. sort of stand up at one level. Perhaps, you know, they couldn't be more static. You know, mm -hmm. they are just these single things rising upwards. On the other hand, because they're so thin as you approach them, they kind of come in and out of focus. Mm -hmm. They seem to move backwards and forwards. They don't just sit there as a single stable object. And if you look at them closely, these female figures, they're not relaxed, they're very tense. Mm -hmm. They're almost standing to attention mm -hmm. and they're looking out at you as if at any moment they may do something, as mm -hmm. if an event might happen. So there's this combination of the sort of enduringly stable and the sort of event-like event -like and the momentary. And um, with Giacometti, there's a kind of tension between the two. Mm -hmm. You feel that this, the sculpture is part of its interest is it's torn between these two modes. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you look at a classical sculpture, it's sort of resolved. You feel that the, the figure may be sort of still, but it's gently moved into place. Mm -hmm. um, its mind is sort of moving, but it's not going to suddenly kind of convulse into some kind of action. Whereas with Giacometti, it's a sort of, you know, you might see it as a problematic that mm -hmm. there's a sort of tension within the notion of temporality, that you want something enduring, you want something that's event-like, but the two don't 
they're together, but they don't quite mesh together. Mm -hmm. So as in so many things in modern art, um, um, uh, sort of aspects of aesthetics that were previously integrated mm -hmm. are kind of set slightly in stark juxtaposition with one another. Hmm. I'm thinking of Boccioni, the, yes. the, mm. the striding, striding man, uh, yes. which is the one that would obviously come yeah, to no. mind. Yes. Are there other examples be besides um, Giacometti that you are interested in? Well, quite a, uh, there's quite a few. I mean, Rod Rodin is also, you know, an uh -huh. interesting case in point. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, uh, what I suddenly realized, I looked at the thinker and I thought, well, the thinker is sort of sitting there. It's called the thinker, but why wasn't <laughs> it called contemplation? And actually, if you look at it, it's really under strain. Every mm -hmm. muscle is flexed. It's mm -hmm. sitting there with mm -hmm. his hand on his chin. So it's, um, it's as if the effort of thinking has almost become a physical effort. And it's as if there's a problem on its or his mind that's suddenly going to sort of explode. That there's, again, there's a sort of real tension mm -hmm. between something that seems to be frozen, but something that is going to spring into action in some way. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's quite a bit of um, Rodin sculptures that sort of fit there. And then later on, I sort of, you know, when one thinks of sort of later sculpture, installation sculpture and that sort of thing, um, there you've got somebody like Robert Smithson, for instance, who does these sculptures like Spiral Jetty, which is, you could think of nothing more solid. You know, he has this huge thing made out of big chunks of volcanic rock spiraling around in the lake. Well, firstly, spiral is a moving mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. A spiral is a, a suggests some kind of moment, uh, movement. And the other thing, of course, is that he was absolutely fascinated by the idea of entropy, mm -hmm. that no matter how permanent anything is, it gradually deteriorates. So I f got fascinated by the way that with something like Smithson Spiral Jetty, you have two different temporalities. You have a human temporality, which is the temporality of him making the sculpture, and then it's sitting there relatively permanently. But in terms of the temporality of geological time, mm -hmm. which Smithson was interested in, this thing is just a tiny little blip in this long process where it will completely disappear mm -hmm. at some point in the future. Um, and that was what really fascinated Smithson, this, this sort of collision between our sense of being part of a world that sort of goes on forever, in which the human is just this tiny event, and then the human sense of there being a sort of, uh, you know, a moment and that there are certain things that are relatively enduring. So are you interested in other earthworking sculptors besides well, Smithson? I've looked at some of them, but I find Smithson's the most sophisticated. And that's, I mean, I'm always somebody who I really like exploring um, artists' statements about their own works mm -hmm. because I find it always gives one a little bit of a cue. You don't have to take artist statements at face value, mm -hmm. but it always gives you a bit of a cue as to what they're on about. And he was a very interesting thinker and a very, uh, a very talented writer as well. And he had a more sophisticated and complex notion of what he was on about than I think most of the other um, land artists. I mean, I think somebody like Michael Heitzer, I think he probably believes he is building for eternity. <laughs> <you know? laughs> I don't think he has this other dimension. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to tell you that we've run out of time. I want to thank you both for uh -huh. taking the time to talk to us today. It's been fascinating learning about your, yes. both of your work, and I'm looking forward to those lectures. Thank you so thanks much. Thanks for thank coming. You. Well, yes. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yes. I've been speaking with Susan Siegfried and Alex Potts, art historians from the University of Michigan. Siegfried gave a talk titled The Cultural Politics of Fashion and the French Revolution of 1830 on May 2nd, 2017. Potts gave a talk titled The Temporality in, Mod Temporality in Modern Sculpture on May 4th, 2017. Both Siegfried and Potts are guests of the U of O's Department of the History of Art and Architecture. Thanks so much for watching.